All right, so let's get started. Um, it's my pleasure to be introducing Dr. Uh, Erica Benedictus, um, who's a postdoctoral uh, like fellow with David Baker at the University of Washington. Um, she graduated from MIT with her PhD in bioengineering uh, just last year, working with uh, Kevin S. Felt and George Church. Um, and I'm very excited to hear today about her work on prants. And uh, Erica, you can take it away. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this seminar series is a great idea. So thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, using evolution to do engineering. And I'm going to start with this classic visual. This is my favorite sort of picture to communicate the power of directed evolution. Uh, this shows how humans have engineered corn. Way over on the left, uh, this little thing looks kind of like wheat. Uh, that's a plant called teosinte which is the plant that people started cultivating back 6,000 years ago when they first started cultivating corn. And over 6,000 years of diversification and selection, uh, people were able to engineer this plant to become the modern crop we know and love today that accounts for 20% of the world's calories and has vastly better properties than what we started with. Um, and they were able to do that simply by using evolution to do engineering. Um, and today I'm going to talk about a, a protein engineering method that I created called PRANCE. Um, I'll talk about how I applied uh, this technique to address a few aspects of evolution that actually make it uh, difficult to use for engineering, um, including that when evolution occurs, sometimes things go extinct, which is not ideal. And also evolution is a random process, which is not always what we want um, when we're doing uh, engineering. So, so one of the challenges with, with using evolution to do engineering is that it does tend to take a long time. So, so in the corn example, this amazing transformation happened over the course of 6,000 years. And when I was working on directed evolution in graduate school, I was rather hoping my PhD would take somewhat less time. Um, and, and, and one of the things that causes evolution to take a long time as a method in, in this example is because the life cycle of corn is actually really slow. So you can only plant corn once a year and it takes a few years to sort of discover uh, which corn plants that, that you've, you've tested are, are better. Um, and a great way to make evolution go faster is to conduct the evolution using an organism that has a faster life cycle. So in grad school, I worked with an evolution technique that relies on this little critter. This is the M13 bacteriophage. So it's a, a virus that infects bacteria. Um, and, and this virus, its entire life cycle is 20 minutes. It can infect, produce baby phage and, and have, them, have them go off into the media in 20 minutes flat. So this is, a, this is a organism that has a really, really fast life cycle. And I worked with a technique called phage assisted continuous evolution, which allows us to do evolution that's focused on individual proteins um, using the fast life cycle of this virus. And so the way this works is you begin by uh, taking some bacteria and engineering a sensor that will detect the protein activity that you're looking for. So you have like a gene circuit inside of your E. coli uh, that will trigger when your desired protein activity is, is occurring inside of the cell. Uh, the next thing you do is you encode uh, the gene that you want to evolve, the protein, um, on the genome of a bacteriophage. Um, and this allows you to get that DNA into cells in really large numbers because you just have the viruses infect bacteria. So you can work with really large populations, 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 13th. Um, of a variance of your gene with this technique. Um, uh, once uh, the phage infects, the DNA that encodes your protein is, is injected into the bacteria. The bacteria will, will transcribe and translate that protein. And if that protein is active, the gene circuit will tr trigger, it will produce this P3 protein, which is the tail fiber of the bacteriophage. Um, which is essential for bacteriophage propagation. And thus you'll get uh, infectious progeny phage that can go forth and increase their numbers. Um, if the protein encoded by that, that bacteriophage is inactive, then nothing happens. 
uh, the gene circuit doesn't trigger, no baby phage, the genome dies, dies with that, that virus. And what's really clever about this technique is you can actually add one more arrow, which is you can have this cycle of infection and propagation occurring continuously in, in, in liquid culture. And what's really cool about this is this cycle over here on the right, it has all the essential elements for evolution to happen. So it has diversification. So when the phage genome replicates, errors accumulate. So, so mutation can, mutations can arise in your gene of interest. And it also has selection. So when the bacterial, the, the circuit in the bacteria either triggers or doesn't, it is selecting in favor of variants that are, are functional. And so you can conduct evolution concerning a single protein uh, in really big populations really rapidly using phage-assisted continuous evolution. Now, you can apply this technique to kind of anything for which you can engineer a sensor in bacteria. So this is sort of a, a sort of small sampling of some of the things people have used PACE to evolve. Uh, most of these are from David Liu's lab at the Broad. Uh, people have used uh, PACE to evolve everything from uh, protein solubility to polymerase promoter binding, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, to base editors, to uh, charging, you know, amino acyl tRNA synthetases, charging tRNAs with new um, amino acids, which I'll, which I'll also talk about. And, and traditionally, sort of what it looks like to conduct one of these experiments is something like this. So this is a traditional PACE equipment setup. Uh, what's going on here is in the middle, these eight little purple and yellow containers, these are housing populations of bacteriophage. So each of those eight vials contains a separate population uh, that is independently evolving to try to solve this evolution puzzle that you've posed to it by feeding it bacteria from one of these, uh, these turbidostats that, that contain a sensor uh, that, that you've engineered. And, and fundamentally, this is like a lot of tubes and equipment, but like fundamentally really all that needs to happen is this. You need to have a container that has an in and an out that is, you know, uh, receiving fresh bacteria uh, that it can infect and, and removing waste um, in, in a constant volume. And so during grad school, I was really interested in this question of like, how could we conduct these evolution experiments in higher throughput? Uh, how could we change this equipment setup to enable us to run not a few, but rather hundreds of independent experiments? And so I made what is essentially a really simple change to you know, this, this equipment setup, which is instead of uh, conducting the liquid transfers with tubes, fixed tubes, um, I conducted the liquid transfers with a pipetting robot. And the way that works is the robot comes along, it adds new, uh, new bacteria, it mixes, and it removes waste. Um, and then off it goes to go uh, service some other, uh, some other container. And the, the benefit of doing it this way is you no longer are limited by how many tubes you are willing to set up. And you can conduct your experiments in 96 well plates. So you get something that looks like this. Um, this is a liquid handling robot that is conducting 96 um, independent evolving populations at once. Um, and it's able to do so with <laughs> zero tubes. Um, another kind of unexpected uh, benefit of uh, having your uh, evolving populations be housed in a, a plate-based format um, is that it's suddenly really easy to, to measure them because they're, they're already in plates. So the liquid handling robot I was using, it has this integrated plate reader, which we can use to take measurements of all of those populations as they go along. So you can measure uh, you can measure uh, a fluorophore, readout, luminescence, you can measure just um, density and, and so on. And it turns out this is like a real game changer actually for how much information you get out of these experiments. Um, so whereas previously you would have your experimental setup that looks like this, uh, if you wanted to take some sort of measurement or, or sort of further understand like what's going on inside of these sealed vessels, you would, uh, I kid you not, you would take a veterinary needle and you would stab the septa uh, and you would, you would extract a sample from, from these containers. Then you would go over to your bench and you would do a plaque assay 
Uh, so, so basically, this is a way of, of quantifying how many, what the concentration is of bacteriophage. So this is a little zoom in on the right. Each of these little polka dots is one, one bacteriophage that has eaten away at a little, a little chunk of a bacterial lawn. Um, and so for, for every sample, you would do a plaque assay, you would wait 12 hours, you would count how many plaques there were, you would enter them into a spreadsheet, and altogether, you would get one dot on one of your graphs that sort of shows you over time, uh, like what, what's going on in your experiment. You get one dot for each uh, veterinary needle and plaque assay that cared to, to do. Um, and, and altogether, uh, this is like a huge amount of work, right? It's like not, it's like not really feasible to, to you know, get, get very much data this way because it's, it's very labor intensive and you have to end up doing a lot of plaque assays even when you only have like a few uh, experiments going on. Even when you only have like five independent populations to sort of work up the time course is just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plaque assays. And that's even worse, of course, when you have 96 independent populations. Now, now you have to do even more plaque assays and it's, it's totally infeasible. And so whereas previously it was a lot of work to sort of understand what was going on, even in a small number of experiments, now with an integrated plate reader, you get all of that data for free. Um, you don't have to do plaque assays, you just get real time measurements of what's going on in every population as they evolve. And so altogether, um, this is a, making this incredibly simple change to just how we do liquid transfers um, allows us to conduct evolution uh, in uh, high throughput. So we can do multiples of 96 evolutions at once. And it allows us to get this really rich data in real time about what is going on inside of those experiments as we go along. And uh, the adjusted acronym <laughs> For, for this technique is phage and robotics assisted near continuous evolution or PRANS, which is what we'll go with from here on out. Um, so I next wanna talk about how I applied PRANS to address uh, features of natural evolution that make it really hard to work with from an engineering perspective. Um, and those two features are extinction. So when things evolve, sometimes they also go extinct and and randomness. Evolution is a random process and that's not always desirable. So we'll, we'll start with extinction. So, so extinction is rather troublesome, right? If you subject a population to an environment that is too challenging, instead of evolving, the population will just die out. And when you're a protein engineer and you're trying to produce an evolved variant of a protein, Obviously, that's a failure, right? Because everything is dead rather than better. Uh, and, and this actually comes with sort of a, a paired problem, which is that if you subject a population to an environment that's too easy, it will also not evolve, which is, again, not ideal. And so you, you face this sort of Goldilocks problem where you have to get an environment that's just right, that it pushes the population to come up with mutations that that provide a, an advantage that make it better, but it's not so hard that, that everything, everything dies out. And this is actually especially challenging when you do multiplex evolution in which perhaps you're evolving a number of biomolecules, which may begin the experiment with different amounts of initial activity. Um, so for example, um, at one point I was trying to evolve some tRNAs which had been engineered to decode new codons. And at the beginning of the experiment, the genotypes that I put into the experiment started out super different in terms of their initial activity. So arginine was like 10 times better than phenylalanine at their, you know, in terms of initial activity. And uh, one reasonable way to attempt to pick some conditions, some environmental conditions to evolve all of these is to pick something that's like kind of in the middle, right? So, so, you, so I attempted to evolve all four of these biomolecules using an environment that was moderately difficult. And unfortunately, that compromise pleased no one. So the three biomolecules that began with less initial activity, 
the moderately difficult environment was already too hard for them and they all just went extinct immediately. Uh, in contrast to the biomolecule that began the experiment with quite a lot of initial activity, the moderate environment wasn't challenging enough. It also didn't evolve, it was too easy. And, and indeed, to successfully evolve these biomolecules, you have to customize the environment. You either have to make it easier. So for the weakest uh, initial performers, you have to give it a lenient environment in order to get it to work. Or for the, the best performers at the, at the start, you have to give it a more stringent environment in order to push it to evolve. And so altogether, there's no one environment that's suitable for evolving all of these different biomolecules because they have very different activity. So I decided that rather than essentially guessing and checking which environment uh, we should use, um, I should use the fact that I have real-time data about what's going on to make a feedback controller. So the idea here is that I uh, give the robot that's running this experiment access to easy, medium, and hard bacteria, and I give it the keys to change which, uh, which, which environment uh, each, each experiment is being subjected to. So it will monitor every experiment independently as, it, as those experiments go along. If that population seems like it's struggling, it will keep the environment easy. If it looks like that population is going gangbusters, it will turn up the difficulty. And what's really cool is this feedback controller was 100% successful at eliminating experimental failure, uh, both because of extinction and because of the two, two easy failures. So, so recall this was the biomolecule that had the least initial activity. Um, this biomolecule uh, you know, spent nearly 15, 20 hours on easy before the robot decided to bump it up to medium and then finally bump it up to hard. Uh, conversely, the biomolecule with the most initial activity, the robot was like, okay, right away, <laughs> we're gonna push it to medium after like five hours. And then it, it spend, spent most of its time on hard. And, and similarly, you know, the other two biomolecules that fell uh, in between similarly uh, received customized environments. And indeed, all four of these biomolecules uh, were successfully evolved by using this feedback controller strategy. And so that's what allows us to take this child, this problem of natural evolution, which is that sometimes things don't evolve, they either go extinct or they're not challenged enough. Um, and we're able to use a feedback controller to eliminate those types of experimental failure and allow us to reliably engineer things with directed evolution. Okay, the next feature of natural evolution that I was interested in is randomness. So evolution occurs when uh, mutations um, uh, accumulate, random mutations accumulate in genes and alter their function. And uh, and so one of the challenges that you have when you're doing engineering with evolution is it's often you get in, you, you face essentially like existential questions of like, okay, here's my evolved gene, uh, which of the mutations it acquired are responsible for it being better? Uh, do I require all of those mutations? And also what do those mutations do? And so I was interested in using uh, Prants and its ability to conduct multiplex evolution to help us uh, conduct experiments in a way that, that make it easier to answer those sorts of questions. Um, so in this experiment, I was evolving the T7 RNA polymerase uh, to bind a new promoter. And instead of conducting this experiment once or a few times, I decided to conduct this evolution in 96 plex. So there are 96 independent populations that are initiated with this single wild type genotype, all of which are independently attempting to find a solution to this evolution puzzle and create a version of that polymerase that's able to initiate 
uh, transcription on a new promoter. And uh, this is an example of the real-time monitoring data we have. So we're able to see that all 96 populations, uh, they successfully are overtaken by some variant that is, is much more successful at, at decoding or initiating on this new promoter. And all of them do so sort of between like 18 and 26 hours after the, the experiment begins. And we're able to see that through, through the, the, the real-time monitoring data. Um, now, at the end of this experiment, uh, uh, I chose uh, 12 different, uh, 12, 12 experiments, and I sequenced full length uh, genotypes uh, for, for polymerases I found within those 12 different populations. So I sequenced several polymerases per population. And what's really cool about conducting evolution experiments in high throughput is that uh, it's, it becomes actually really obvious uh, which mutations matter. So in this case, uh, all of, there are many independent experiments that identify mutations at residue 219 and at residue 748. And because those are the mutations that are convergent, so because um, we see those mutations over and over again, we can infer that those are the mutations that matter. Um, in contrast, mutations that occur at other locations are, are incidental and they're much less likely to, to be changing functionally what that polymerase does. Um, so this is a, a really good technique. And in fact, uh, people who have been using PACE for some time have, have made an effort to run like at least sort of three independent experiments anytime they run a PACE because otherwise it's just impossible to sort of know which mutations matter and, and what's important to, to work up and understand in post. Now, the other thing, and, and this was not something we were looking for, so this was just a, a cool thing that we noticed in this data, is that it actually seemed like the identity of the final genotype was related to how fast the evolution occurred. So now I've annotated these 12 different uh, experiments that I worked up by when they passed half max. So when they went from, if you fit a sigmoid, when when that half maximum uh, time is. And it seems an awful lot, you know, even just looking at it visually, like the early evolvers tend, are more likely to have a mutation at 748. And, and conversely, later evolvers are more likely to have a mutation at 219. And so this was kind of a head scratcher, actually. We were not sure why <laughs> this was the case. Um, it is also statistically significant, so this is a thing. Uh, and eventually we figured out that under the hood, like mechanistically what's going on here is that uh, the mutation at 209, residue 219 is a transversion mutation, whereas the mutation at 748 is a transition mutation. And based on the mu mutational spectra in these bacteria, the transition mutations are much happen much more often than transversion mutations. Um, and further, that you only, need, you only need one or the other of these mutations in order to have a big fitness advantage. And so the reason that we see this data is because uh, the phage that phage are more likely to pick up this, this transition mutation and thus evolve quickly. Um, and, and thus, those are the early evolvers. Whereas phage uh, that pick up transversion first are tend to be the late evolvers because it is it is less common. So this is like a this is a cool example of how like because we kind of have both genotypic and essentially kinetic data about how fast the evolutions occur, we're able to gain a lot more insight into why we see um, the genotypes that we see. Um, so so we can sort of solve this question of which mutations matter using a uh, better sampling. We can we can conduct evolutions in high throughput and thus uh, gain a better understanding of, of what those mu which mutations are are functional. Um, and I'll I'll talk uh, I'll give one more example of sort of addressing randomness, um, uh, which is uh, conducting evolutions in in such a way that we can better understand what the mutations do. Um, so in this experiment, we were evolving an aminoacyl tRNA synthetase to charge a tRNA with a new non-canonical amino acid. And the way we set up this experiment was 
we did everything in quadruplicate. So we have four, uh, four replicates of, of every evolution we were conducting. And uh, in half of the experiments, we added Bach lysine, which was the non-canonical amino acid of interest. And in the other half of the experiments, we didn't add the non-canonical. So this, this set of experiments on the left is essentially a negative control. And it allows us to infer whether the amino acyl tRNA synthetase that we are evolving in this experiment is prone to uh, charging its tRNA with a canonical amino acid, which is present in every experiment, whether you add it or not. Um, and what's interesting is uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetase evolutions are quite prone to this particular cheater condition where they evolve like a promiscuous synthetase that charges a canonical amino acid rather than a non-canonical. So this is something people know to look for. And because we didn't see anything evolve over in our negative control on the left, we can infer that it's very likely that the mutations these proteins picked up over here on the right in our, our real evolutions are, are things we actually want. Um, our mutations that are serving to improve its interaction with Bach lysine in particular, rather than other um, potential canonical amino acids. Um, and indeed, when we uh, worked up uh, biochemically uh, to determine which amino acid this synthetase integrates, um, we saw that yes, indeed, it is not promiscuous, just as our control suggested. Um, so this is a really cool example of how, because we have access to just more populations, we're able to run high throughput experiments, we're suddenly able to create, we, we have enough space that we can do controls that give us a lot of insight into what is happening and what the function is of, of proteins we're evolving that previously would be just, no one would have space in their experiment to, to run controls like this. Um, and so this, this is a really valuable way to gain insight into what the proteins do that you have managed to evolve um, in your experiment. Um, so altogether, this, uh, this project was done uh, while I was in grad school in Kevin Eswelt's lab at MIT. Um, Emma and Brian were two postdocs who worked on this project. They worked more on the sort of molecular biology side and Dana and Stefan um, both uh, worked on a lot of the software actually that was that was necessary to get all of this to, to work together. Um, and you can read more about this in both of these papers down here. Um, the one on the bottom is about plants in particular, and the one on the top is about other sorts of experiments that we were able to do with, uh, with sort of this advanced automation. Um, okay, so for the last few minutes, I wanted to talk about how I see Prance um, sort of fitting into protein engineering as a field more broadly in the future. And I want to highlight one result that I, I haven't mentioned yet, which is uh, while Emma and I were uh, evolving these, doing these tRNA evolution experiments, um, one of the things that we, we took the opportunity to do was we, we tried to work up the entire evolutionary history of how one of these tRNAs had evolved. So we, we took the samples that the robot had taken of these populations all the way through the whole the whole time course of the experiment. And we sequenced using NGS, uh, uh, we sequenced, we, like deep sequenced, what the identity was of all of the tRNAs in that population through the entire time. And so using that data, we were able to reconstruct what the likely phylogeny was of how all of these different variants we see in this, this population are related to one another, as well as get this data about sort of kinetically, we get to see how they compete with one another over time, right? And so this is an example. This is an example of the phylogenetic reconstruction and the sort of time course data for just two of these CRNAs. Now, what's really cool about this is that um, Traditional, you know, biology has this whole tradition of tools that we know how to use. We know how to apply to phylogenetic trees. We have so many ways to understand the function, infer the function of different protein residues 
or, or on a larger scale genes by comparing the phylogeny of, of different proteins. And similarly now with, you know, AlphaFold, uh, we also of course know that phylogenies encode structure, right? Um, and so what's really cool about this is we have a directed evolution platform that is sufficiently high throughput that we can construct our own phylogenies that concern proteins and protein functions that perhaps nature has never wanted, right? So in this case, uh, this is a phylogeny that concerns tRNAs that decode four base codons. Nature never wanted that, right? We have a, a triplet codon code. And so we're, we're getting to see uh, data of a sort that isn't available naturally, right? And uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is taking PRANCE as a technique and applying it not just to produce a evolved protein that exhibits a new function that we desire, but also to produce a synthetic phylogeny that tells us, gives us some flavor and background about why that protein works and how it functions. Um, and take that synthetic phylogeny and apply the entire toolkit we have for, for analyzing those that, that biology has, has given us. Um, so I think to do that, there's sort of three steps. Um, so the first is to initiate these continuous evolution experiments using libraries. So one of the things that's, uh, that's amazing about continuous evolution like PACE and PRANCE um, is that uh, mutation happens all the time. Every time the phage genome replicates every 20 minutes, uh, mutations are introduced. Um, and, and in fact, the, the bacteria we use uh, have this, this inducible mutagenesis plasmid that raises the mutation rate really, really high. And because this is such an engine for introducing mutations into genes, the traditional view has been that one can just skip uh, the, the normal practice of initiating your directed evolution experiment with a library. Because why bias your population toward what you think uh, your evolved protein should look like when nature will just, just explore the whole space for you. And I think with the goal in particular of producing synthetic phylogenies in mind, uh, we now will get a lot out of initiating these evolutions with libraries, once again. Um, it, uh, if our goal is to not just produce an evolved protein, but also uh, take this opportunity to produce this rich data set, this synthetic phylogeny, um, then uh, it'll be really valuable for us to initiate multiplex evolutions with different combinations of, of recombined library members in particular. And so I think there's a, a sort of two, two parts to this. One is the uh, experimental part of how do you produce large libraries that are appropriate. Um, as usual, Frances Arnold has us covered. Uh, she figured out how to do this 20 years ago. Uh, like all like all important techniques in, in directed evolution. Um, I think the second important thing is to understand from a computational standpoint, how should we optimally design libraries that we're initiating evolution experiments with such that we get the most valuable data out on the other end. And I think that's that's something we, we still have, uh, we have not yet figured out a, a, a robust method for, for computing. Um, the second step, once you have initiated an evolution with a library, is to uh, evolve it for and uh, evolve it long enough that you can see a long evolutionary trajectory. So this is an example from this great paper Ahmed Badran wrote when when he was in grad school, in which he was evolving Bt toxins using PACE. And what was remarkable about this paper was that he evolved them for a very long time. Uh, on the order of wall clock, I think it was like a couple of weeks. Um, and in the process of evolving it for, for quite some time, he ended up observing variants that had acquired a really long series of, of mutations. Um, and, and similarly, Emma and I uh, similarly conducted experiments that, that you know, occupied a lot of wall clock time. And that may also reach sort of these levels of, of of length of evolutionary trajectories. And so I think the challenge here is even though PACE is really good at doing continuous mutagenesis, even though it is really good at observing long trajectories, 
um, we're still going to want to push the envelope in order to see trajectories that are sufficiently long to, to give us information about how and why um, the mutations we're seeing have arisen. So I think, I think we'll want to push the envelope in this dimension. Um, and finally, uh, the last challenge is working up the genotypes that have arisen in one of these continuous evolution experiments. So the example I gave earlier of these, uh, the synthetic phylogenies for tRNAs was kind of the easy case because tRNAs are really small. So they tend to be about like 70 base pairs. And uh, performing a similar feat when you have a full length protein is more challenging. And uh, fortunately, in the past couple of years since we did the tRNA experiment, um, a couple of groups have actually published techniques for using NGS or nanopore, a few different ways of doing it, to characterize full length genotypes for, for, for whole proteins. Um, and so uh, it remains to be done to sort of actually connect that to PACE and use these techniques to fully work up um, whole genotypes from, from real continuous evolution experiments. <clears throat> Um, and so sort of putting all of that together, uh, something I'm excited about is uh, taking uh, computationally designed libraries that are designed to not just give us an evolved variant, but also tell us about how that evolved variant works, um, use those in continuous evolution experiments, which produce genotypes, which we sort of fully work up in order to create a synthetic phylogeny from which we can predict um, structure or function of, of these new proteins that nature um, has never wanted, in addition to producing just the protein itself. Um, and as a last little note, I want to put in a plug, this is my last slide, I want to put a plug in for the bioautomation challenge, which is a, a program I started that's uh, sort of focused on actually this research community. Um, those of us who are interested in producing data sets um, that, that tell us about proteins um, and leveraging those data sets using learned models or other computational techniques. Um, and uh, applications for this uh, program are actually due tomorrow, but we'll, have, we'll probably have an additional program uh, coming in a, in a couple months. Um, but essentially, the idea here is I want to make a venue in which academic scientists Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, I want to I want to create an opportunity for academics to access top of the line uh, automation technology in order to produce really reproducible uh, measurement techniques for proteins um, that will allow us to collect really large high fidelity data sets. Um, that, and then uh, distribute that data amongst sort of the machine learning community. So so keep an eye out for this. Um, and finally, I'd like uh, my mentors. Um, I talked about the work I did mostly in, in Kevin's lab, but I also want to thank Ahmed and, and David, um, who, who also mentored me in grad school and during my postdoc, um, and happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Erica, for an amazing talk. Um, I'd like to, to open the, the floor for, for questions. Uh, Anyone has a, a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and speak up. But I'll, I guess I'll, I'll start with a, a question that I had. So earlier uh, on in the talk, you were talking about um, this access of the, this access of the uh, ease with which um, variants are evolving, uh, and I guess using different strains of bacteria to tune. Uh, along this axis between yeah, easy, kind of medium, or, or, or very challenging. Um, I'm curious uh, why this is kind of like the relevant uh, mechanism that you use to tune this, this challenge, uh, say, rather than dilution rate or, or some other mechanism that could potentially uh, can control this. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, you can also, and we have also, altered the dilution rate, which is, is a way to sort of easily modulate the stringency. Um, the difficulty is that uh, changing the dilution rate, if you double the dilution rate, it makes it twice as hard. Whereas changing the selection circuit you use can totally change by a thousand times how hard it is. 
so so essentially like the difficulty is just um uh it, it's just a matter of scale I, I mean essentially like the 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 very best way to alter the stringency of the environment is using the using using different selection circuits and um there's also sort of another part to this there's a there's a great figure in the paper that that shows us measuring the transfer function that relates actual activity like sort of absolute activity of the protein to how many phage progeny are produced and the ideal selection circuit for for conducting an evolution would be one that's like a sharp sigmoid where the 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 sigmoid changes uh, height at exactly the activity level that your population is currently at so that things that have even a tiny boost get like a big fitness advantage and so so that's like another reason which is like you can change not just the scaling of the of the transfer function by changing the dilution rate but you can also change like the entire shape of the transfer function if you change the the circuit um so so it's a much better way it's like it's like a little uh it, it's a much it's a much more effective way to change the environment essentially great thank you hi erica this is jody uh i have a question about when you talked about using a negative control for your mm -hmm. tRNA experiment and um i'm curious if in the negative control you could also use uh kind of the mutation seen there. I actually am curious if it mutates at all and if if it does have mutations, if you can kind of tell those mutations are not important because they're just happening randomly. Uh, I assume the mutations are not constant along the entire gene, right? Yeah, so this is a great this is a great point. Um yeah, so you can you can sequence the negative control. Um and yeah, it, it will not it tends not to acquire mutations that are convergent which was the 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 cue that we saw in the in the other experiment that that something matters um and so so yeah you can you can do that for sure i'm not actually i'm not sure if we sequence uh i'm not sure if we sequence these protein variants in particular because i think i mean one one of the things that's that's sort of better about the real-time data than sequencing data is you get it right away right so so had we seen a spike at 15 hours in in this this negative control we might have turned the experiment off right uh we might have like not not spent money on sequencing so i think that's that's another thing which is like you're totally right you you can you can sort of confirm this further by working up the genotypes but a nice thing here is you get this data like in real time and it can allow you to make decisions about like how you're going to spend your weekend right um like but before before working stuff up so that, that's another difference, but yeah, that's a good point. Gotcha, thank you. I'm gonna jump in and ask a second question. Um, what, what you were saying before about like modifying the, the transfer function and, and thinking about the midpoint of the sigmoid is kind of where you optimally, uh, want to be optimally for, uh, for evolution this is super neat. Um, I'm curious for this latter piece of trying to reconstruct phylogenies and maybe learn about fitness of different variants. Uh, if your considerations on that piece or, or more broadly change uh, in terms of how you think about experimental setup and, and what makes uh, ideal selection conditions. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think one thing that differs is in the scenario where we want to construct synthetic phylogenies, uh, we would be more interested in drift, right? So we are more interested in populations that are just free to mutate at residues for which it doesn't break the protein because that encodes structure and other things, right? Um, whereas, you know, in, in most of PACE's application to date, People just want to get a protein that works essentially as fast as possible. And if we're also interested in the synthetic phylogeny, we may be more interested in maintaining population diversity. We may be more interested in observing like 
you know, synonymous mutations or mutations that don't improve, don't change the function all that much, right? But just sort of tell us stuff about the structure. And so altogether, I expect that means that we would evolve um, at lower stringency. So, so still high enough that the function of the protein, the, the protein must remain functional, but at a lower stringency to encourage like large diverse populations essentially. Um, but, but this is actually both in the case of constructing the phylogeny and in the case of trying to evolve things quickly and effectively, it's a kind of outstanding question about like how one should optimally uh, tune the environment. So like in my feedback control experiment, I used a really simple feedback control mechanism in which the robot got to choose when to bump it up to moderate and when to bump it up to stringent. So it just picks it just picks two numbers and it does so upon detecting that the population has like increased in its signal. But that's not necessarily optimal either, right? I mean, perhaps, you know, the, the feedback controller itself could also be more sophisticated in, in you know, regardless of whether your goal is a, a fast evolution or a diverse phylogeny, right? So I think there's a lot of interesting questions there. And if there are no other questions, I'll, I'll ask one more. Um, yeah. So I'm really curious how, how and if you see this line of work with directed evolution combining together with the bioautomation challenge and uh, automation in, in general uh, in, in biology. So certainly Pace and, and Prance are on the cutting edge of the cutting edge in terms of experimental methods for learning about proteins. Do you think this is anywhere close to, to reaching a position where we're you could uh, license out to a cloud lab to do a directed evolution experiment? Uh, that's one of the hopes, for sure. I, I mean, I would say also like, you know, I think there's a lot, I think in protein engineering, we all have the same problems. So like the reason two different groups publish techniques for how to work up the sequencing results of evolution experiments is that everyone has this problem, right? And what would be ideal is if one group could create this method and then we could all just send our samples in and access the method rather than all of us reinventing the wheel over and over. And that goes for tons of stuff, creating libraries, working up results, conducting prants, you know, measuring, measuring, prop, you know, biochemical properties of proteins. I mean, I, I think protein engineering is a minefield of techniques that uh, could, could be standardized uh, to everyone's benefit. Um, and so that's why that's part of why the bioautomation challenges focuses on protein engineering as a field, because I think we will all find lots of experimental techniques that we share and would like to have conducted in a way that is more robust and reliable and reproducible and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, uh, as you said, Prance is a little bit cutting edge, so I think it will it will be available in cloud labs probably after you know following many of these other somewhat less uh complex techniques but for sure that is the goal i would love to be able to just send in samples and have someone else run prance on them um can i ask a question um so um where where in the prance pipeline do you see machine learning playing a role and what uh, sort of methods do you see being applicable yeah, uh, I think probably in a lot of different steps. So I think uh, on the sort of library design step, um, that's somewhere where perhaps not machine learning, but like computational techniques could be much more advanced for giving us good library designs to initiate things with. Um, I think this question Brian had earlier about uh, how do we pick the feedback control I think that's something actually where uh, having computational techniques for sort of understanding and responding to uh, sort of real-time evolution data uh, would be helpful. And I think there's a lot to unpack there about exactly what the goal of the evolution is and how to sort of optimize it. Um, and I think finally, like, you know, creating these synthetic phylogenies, 
these these phylogenies will have somewhat different properties than traditional phylogenies. Um, and so I think there will be a lot of interesting uh, computation to be done in terms of how to like integrate this this information and make the best use of it. And some of that is as simple as like, you know, let's plug our our MSA of like our our phylogenetic variants we got out of this experiment into AlphaFold, right? So so some of it's kind of straightforward, but I, I think there may be more sophisticated changes we need to make to some of these traditional techniques to sort of play nicely with somewhat different phylogenies that we'll get out of this. Thanks. Great. So if there aren't any additional questions, let's all thank, uh, thank Erica again for, for coming and joining. And we'll all look forward to seeing you next week at the discussion panel. Awesome. Thank you. This was fun. <laughs>